Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 24 of the Chibi Akama series of my Z80 programming tutorials. We looked last time at compiled sprites, and I showed you how to use the Aqua Sprite Editor, my free sprite program, to create a compiled sprite that would work on the Amstrad CPC or the ZX Spectrum. Now, this time we're going to look at the source code, and we're going to find out how the Aqua Sprite Editor creates compiled sprites and the tricks I've used to make the sprite as fast as possible, but keep them small enough to fit in memory. Now, if you missed what a compiled sprite was, a compiled sprite is a piece of program code solely designed to draw a picture to screen. This means it's very, very fast. It does have some limitations, like it probably can't do clipping or flipping of sprites and things, but it, it's the sheer speed, and this is how you get very big graphics to the screen very quickly. And this is what Chibi Akamas used to do the last boss battle in episode two, and I'll just show you that now. And so here's the last boss battle, and you can see here there's this pre-rendered animation in the background that is going on while the gameplay is still fairly frantic, and this is done with a compiled sprite. So these are 8K frames of animation that are loaded in the extra memory of a 256K machine to um, make this really quite large animated background on a limited machine like the Amstrad CPC, and this can only be done with compiled sprites really, within gameplay at least. And so that's an example of what a compiled sprite can do. Now, this time we're going to look at the source code that Aqua Sprite Editor produces and see what kind of tricks are being done. So this is the compiled sprite we're actually going to be looking at today. It's the so-called haunting bitmap here. We're going to look at the code that actually produces this image on the screen. So this is just generic code. This is something I use in my true tutorials just to initialize the screen. This pick clip image is the actual start of the graphic drawing routine that handles the compiled sprite. So let's take a look at it here. Now you'll see the first thing we're doing is we're backing up the stack pointer on the Z80 machines with a memory mapped screen. The best way to draw graphics to the screen is with push commands. This is known as stack misuse. We copy data into our registers and push those registers, effectively pushing two bytes to the screen. And it's about twice the speed of any other command on the system. So that's what we're going to want to do. We're then loading the stack pointer with the right hand side of the top line of our screen. What we're doing next is we're loading IX with this pointer to something called draw order. And then we're jumping to a command called jump to next line. And we'll see that in just a moment. But let's take a look at this draw order and let's see what that actually is. Well, here it is. And you can see it's an array of pointers. Each of these pointers is a set of commands to draw that line. Now, unfortunately, in today's example, it hasn't really helped. It's actually wasted memory. But in most cases, there will be a lot of lines that can be drawn in the same way. For example, in that boss battle I just showed you, you will notice the image was interlaced. So every other line was completely black. So the example there, every other line would be using the same drawing routine. And this allows you to save a lot of memory because compiled sprites are fast. They are not small. So that's the solution I came up with here. I'm using a table of lookups. And if there were, say, 20 consecutive lines that could all be done with the same drawing routine. I have a function called a looper, which will actually just save a few bytes here because having 100 lines that have a two byte reference in the pointer means you're using 200 bytes. And in some cases, that's more wasteful than we need. As I say, it's not unfortunately helped in this case, but you're always having to work on the averages. And in the average case, it does help. So that's what the draw order is. And let's take a look at this jump to next line command. Well, the jump to next line command is effectively reading in an address from that list, and then it's jumping to that address. Now, we can't make much use of calls within our code because, of course, we're drawing to the screen using the stack pointer. And while we might be able to do a single call in some cases, which would corrupt two bytes of the screen, we do have to make sure we're not at a position where we're actually going to corrupt real memory or data that we've just drawn. So we do have to be a little bit careful in some cases. And so in this case, we're using a jump here, and we're jumping to the line drawing routine. And let's have a look at that line drawing routine. Here is the code that does the first line. Now you can see a lot of pushes. And of course, these are pushes of data to the screen. The first thing we're doing is we're loading DE with double zero, which will be a background pixel, it would be black if we got our proper colors. But we're actually blue in this case. And as you can see here, we're drawing the top line, which has a lot of blank space in it. So we should see that represented in the code here. We're running a command called multipush DE5. Now you'll notice we're doing a call here. Whenever we do a call, we're effectively corrupting two bytes to the left of whatever we're currently drawing. In this case, that's not going to be a problem. So let's take a look at multipush DE5. Here it is. We're doing a pop to HL. We've effectively just got the return address. And now we're doing five consecutive pushes. You see, we're jumping to this routine 
And so whenever we're doing large numbers of pushes, we're kind of clustering them all together into this common place because each of these pushes is a single byte. And so if we were doing, let's say 20 pushes, well, we don't want to have 20 pushes within the line code. We want to have them in a common place and jump to it to save some space within the line code. So that's what we're doing here. We're doing all those pushes and then we're effectively doing a return here via that HL return address that we popped off here. And we had to pop it off here because it was effectively drawn to the screen at that point. So now we've returned back to here, but and we're going to have to write some actual bitmap data that's not all blank. So first we're using HL, we're loading in HL here, and we're pushing that to the screen. So we've just written this 0080 byte, and then we're writing 7100 with BC, and then we want to make some more blank bytes. Now the sprite compiler knows what the status of every single register is. It knows DE still holds 00. It also knows that HL was corrupted by this command here. So what it's doing is it's saying, well, I don't need to set DE again. I can just keep pushing it. So we're now writing more bytes here by exploiting that current state here. And it also knows at this point, it wants to write 0040. And it knows that HL holds 0080. So it only needs to change the bottom byte of HL to be able to use that in another push. And it does that here. And then it uses DE again for some more blank filling. And then it uses BC, and again, what does it want? Well, it wants 8000, and it knows BC is 7100, so it just changes the top byte. Now, the way the sprite compiler works is it's switching between the registers using DE for its block pushing, and HL and BC alternately, and wherever possible, if it needs to set a value, it will do it in the most efficient way possible. So if the bottom byte's correct, it will only set the top byte. If it needs to set L and the value it wants to set L2 is held within D, it will do it that way. And each time saving a byte, saving a little bit of speed. And that's how we're doing it. We're, we're always working out the fastest way of getting the data we want onto the screen. The only sacrifice we're making is we have to do some things to make the code small, because if it's too big to fit in memory, then we've defeated ourselves. Effectively, the sprite compiling in the C-sharp code is kind of working like a reverse assembler. It's working out what commands it wants to do and then working out what the state of the registers in the processor will be at that point and then using that to work out what the next actions it needs to take are. And that's why it knows it doesn't need to set H here, it doesn't need to set C here. And if we scroll down, we will see other similar examples like here where it is using the fact that Hey, C equals 50 here, and it now wants DE to be 5050. So it's doing that via these two commands here, and it's doing those similar things here. It's always looking for the most efficient way to get the registers to have the value that they need to have at that point. Now, at the end of this line, now at the end of drawing this line, we're using this next line push BC command. Well, let's take a look at that. Well, what's this do? Well, it's a push BC followed by a next line command. And this is again, it's a little bit of a trick. This is gonna be something we're gonna to have to do quite often. And rather than having a push BC and then a jump, well, let's merge the two together into a single jump and that will save one byte because it's gonna be something we're gonna to need quite to do quite often. And that's what it's all about. How can we make things as small as possible? Because if we're doing a full screen, 200 lines, then saving one byte at the on the last command of each of those lines is saving us 200 bytes. and every byte counts because we need those bytes to make the thing faster. So we're doing a push here and then we're jumping to our next line command here and that's what we saw before. And you'll also see that next line push DE will roll into the next line command. And so that's one of the tricks that I'm using to make the code as fast as possible. Now, generally speaking, using push commands and working out the fastest ways to get those push commands is what we want to do to save time and make things fast. But we do have to sacrifice because sometimes we need to push data that is effectively random and doing lots and lots of load HLs and DEs and lots and lots of pushes, that's gonna start eating up our memory space. So we've got to sacrifice a little bit. So we've got a command called bitmap push here and you'll notice the different lengths of bitmap push depending on how many bytes we're pushing. And the following command after the call to bitmap push is an address within the so-called bitmap data. 
and you can see the bitmap data here is just a load of apparently random numbers and these are bitmap data that we're going to need to draw to the screen. Now whenever the AccuSprite editor can't work out a way to compile the bitmap data into something efficient for pushes, like there's a lot of consecutive randomish bytes, what it does is it stores them in bitmap data. The first thing it does is it looks at the previously defined bitmap data to see if that combination of bytes is already held in there. If it is, it will use the previous location. If it's not, it will tag it on to the end. So there shouldn't be any excessive redundancy within this. And so that's where we get our data. And it's these bitmap push commands that actually get that data to the screen. So each bitmap push command will load the B register with a length, and that's the number of words that we're going to want to transfer. And then it jumps to the bitmap push command. And here it is. And what bitmap push does is first it backs up DE. Now DE is used for our bulk filling. And so because of that, we're likely to want it again. So by backing it up and restoring it, we're probably saving some bytes later on that would probably be used to reset DE otherwise. Next, what we're doing is we're reading in the memory address of the bitmap data and we're loading that into HL here. And then what we're doing is we're loading in a pair into DE and we're pushing it to the screen and we're repeating until B reaches zero because B was set by our original call. Now, once we're done, we're then jumping to IY. IY was the return address. We added two to it because we read in the two bytes that were after that. And now we've jumped back to our original code. Now, one thing is there is an alternate version called final bitmap push, and this is actually for the end of a line. And once again, this automatically rolls into a return here, a return to the next line code. And again, this is to make sure that we don't have lots of jumps to the next line code. We, we're kind of trying to build them into other code at the same time. So those are the main tricks that the compiled sprite generator that I wrote does for us to get those bitmaps, to get those images fast, but to keep them small enough to load into memory. Now, if you're feeling adventurous and you know another programming language, of course, you could write one of these yourself. And I personally found it a lot of fun. There's definitely other sprite compilers out there I could have just used off the shelf. But when I was programming my game, it wasn't how can I make the best game in the world? It's how can I make the best game that I can make? So I tried to write as much of the code as I felt I could within reason. And so I wrote my own Sprite compiler and had a lot of fun doing it. So maybe this has given you some ideas for your own Sprite compilers. And maybe, and I mean, in a lot of ways, if you wanted to write your own, I think you should probably just start from the simple things and just you know see what inspires you and what ideas you come up with. And maybe you'll be able to create something far better than I did. It's certainly very likely, I think. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Maybe it's given you some ideas of getting ways to get data to the screen super fast. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.